I've spent an uncomfortable amount of my professional life managing and creating Google Ads campaigns. So setting up ad campaigns on Google and then using data to optimize those campaigns over time. There's a perception in and around Google Ads that running Google Ads is a bit like a tap. In that when you want the traffic, when you want more visitors to your website, you just turn the tap on and people appear at a cost, of course. When you no longer want that traffic, or if it's if you decide it's not working for you, then you just turn it off. And compared to, say, SEO, the tap analogy does work because it is much more instant on, instant off. But for anyone who's actually set up and optimized and managed a Google Ads campaign, you'll know that there's actually a lot of there's, there's a lot of optimizations in between the initial setup project, which in many cases is your working assumptions and your best practices of what you think is going to work, and then actually having a campaign that's optimized and working and delivering profitable client leads. There's a period of optimization between those two states. This is true in Google Ads. It's also true in email marketing as well. So on the last episode of the Story Selling Podcast, we were talking about the lead incubator system. The lead incubator is an email sequence that sits in between the point at which new contacts opt in to your world and the point at which they're ready to have a sales conversation with you. By default, the lead incubator runs for 12 days and spans three different acts. So we covered that in the last episode of the podcast. But of course, there's various assumptions baked into this sequence. There's assumptions about how many emails to include, what stories to include, what ordering of the stories, where do you place your calls to action? What is the right call to action? There's various working assumptions and actually a bit like in creating a Google ads campaign, you have to start off with your first best guess as to what you think is going to work for your audience. But in some respects that becomes your control version. That is your version A. And then as you push more data through the lead incubator, you can create a version B and start to optimize, start to figure out where did you make erroneous assumptions? What, what levers can you pull to deliver better results? So that's the topic of today's episode. And as always, we're going to cover three ideas. And those ideas are metrics, variables, and testing options. So let's go ahead and have a look at the first idea. To optimize your lead incubator system, obviously you need to have something you can measure. So the, lead, so the lead incubator is a system because it has inputs and it has outputs. The inputs are the people that you add to the system. They're the people that you meet at networking events. They're the people that opt in to your email list from your website. The output is whatever step you define in order for people to initiate uh, a project with you. So that may, that may well be phoning you up. It may just be replying to an email. It might be filling in a form on your website. In order to optimize the lead incubator, we need to be very clear on what this next step is. And ideally, there just needs to be one next step. Depending on your business, it might be that there are multiple next steps that people can take and actually the correct next step for someone might depend on the on their budget, for instance. It might depend on, you know, whether they're looking to do some of the work themselves. Perhaps if they've got a lot of money but not much time, then the right next step is for them to speak to you one-on-one -on -one about hiring you. Perhaps if they've got more time and not so much money, perhaps the next step is that they buy your book. Or perhaps the next step is that they buy a training course from you. So there could conceivably be multiple next steps, but the more next steps you have, the harder it is to optimize your lead incubator because you're then optimizing for two variables. Obviously, if you, if you have two outcomes, it might be that you make some changes and you increase one outcome, but not the other. You know, again, going back to Google ads, we used to see this all the time where if you had multiple conversion actions, you would take, you, you would make various changes to increase your number of sales, for instance, but you might find then that the number of people opting into the email list would decline. 
So we have the same situation here. So in an, in an ideal world, you just have one audience that maybe is your main audience. And this is, this is, these are the group of people that you most want to help, that you most want to serve in your business. And for your ideal clients, you figure out what the next step is just for that ideal client. And then you optimize the lead incubator to cater to your ideal clients. So in some respects, yes, you might have multiple next steps at the end of the sequence that people can take, but you want to prioritize them. You want to figure out what for you as the business owner, which next steps are most valuable to you in terms of scaling the impact that your work has on the world. For most of my clients, usually it's a precursor to a sales conversation. Usually it's booking some time with you. Um, that's probably the most likely scenario, actually, that someone someone books 30 minutes on your calendar to speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. Not that that is necessarily the right next step for you, but it's prob probably the starting point. You know, if you're, if you're in a service-based business, that's normally what I'm recommending people people place at the end of the lead incubator but you know if if you do have multiple next steps at the end so maybe option one is to book 30 minutes on your calendar option two is to sign up for your training course it might be that you start to segment people as they go through the sequence and this could be based on action it could be based on you know perhaps you send them an email up front and you say oh which of, which of these best describes you you know are you looking to do this just yourself click here or are you looking for help hands-on help and depending on what they select you can then start to segment them and push them down one channel or the other it might also it might also be that you segment people based on activity so this is this is where your your choice of email marketing system comes into play because many marketing automation and email marketing systems will assign a lead score to the people in each sequence so as people open and engage with your emails the lead score goes up sometimes it's a flame score and you can see on the contact record you can see a flame score out of five and then it might be that at the end of the sequence if their flame score is three or higher that you that you offer them 30 minutes of time on the calendar if their flame score is two or below then maybe you push them towards the training course. So that way you're only inviting people who have engaged with your emails to book 30 minutes with you and not the people who haven't really been paying that much attention. Beyond your main next step, there's then going to be a number of interim metrics. So things that you want to measure and optimize, but things that are stepping stones towards you know driving more business. As far as I can see, the main interim metrics that you want to measure are open rate. Open rate is particularly useful for comparing one email in your sequence versus another email. Click-through rate, and this is particularly relevant on emails that you send where there is a specific call to action, where you're asking the reader to go and book 30 minutes of time on your calendar, because those emails are really where the rubber hits the road. So if you can test and optimize one of those emails to say take your click-through rates from 10% to 15%, that actually has quite a big outcome on your, on your results. The third metric, the third interim metric that I would consider is also deliverability, which basically means are your emails getting through? For most of my clients, I advise them to send HTML emails, but styled in a fairly basic way. Styled as if you're emailing someone from your Gmail or from your Outlook. So I normally don't advise people to send image heavy graphical magazine type emails because it increases the chance of your email not being delivered. Or even if it is delivered, it's more likely to end up in the spam folder. I would also keep an eye on your hard bounces. So hard bounces are where you email someone and the email address doesn't work. It's like, you know, they've entered daffyduck at gmail.com as their email address. So obviously, if you are getting a large number of hard bounces, there's almost not much point optimizing everything else, optimizing your open rates, optimizing your click-through rates, because it might be that you're just attracting the wrong people in the first place. So that's more of a balance and check, really. It's just, just checking, are your emails being delivered? 
and D you have a sort of reasonably reasonably low number of hard bounces. You always get some because some people misspell their email address, but I wouldn't expect that many. The second idea we're going to look at then is the different variables that you can optimize in order to deliver a better outcome from your lead incubator system. The first variable I want to look at, and perhaps the main one for me, is sequence length. In other words, how many emails do you include in your sequence? So you might recall from last week that I recommend in the lead incubator that you send one email a day for the duration of your lead incubator sequence. This is almost like your onboarding process for new potential clients. So by sending an email every day, you force people in some respects to make a decision on whether they know, like, and trust you. By default, I, I suggest that you start off with 12 emails in the sequence. That allows a little bit of nuance. It allows, a bit of, it allows some development in the stories that you tell, and it allows you to place four emails in each act. However, the, this is a working assumption. The minimum that you could include in your lead incubator is four emails, which would be one email in, in each act and then a call to action email at the end. So potentially your entire email onboarding system for new potential clients could just be four days. It could just be four emails sent over four days with a very strong take action now, call to action at the end. On the other hand, you could in, you, you might consider extending the sequence to longer than 12 days. I would consider testing up to 30. And this is based on data. It's also based on what I've seen other people doing as well. And sending emails over a 30 day period or over a month really allows someone to get to know you. It's a good writing exercise as well, because if you're going to write 30 emails, you really need to explore your story in some depth. You really need to think about the stories that you're sharing and why you're sharing them. Those 30 emails might still fit the three act structure. So in the first act, you're demonstrating your understanding of the problem. In act two, you're demonstrating your revisions in understanding, which makes up the story spine. And in act three, you're demonstrating the outcome that you, that you provide. If you were to include 30 emails in the sequence, it might not be that you have seven or eight emails in act one, seven or eight emails in act two, then seven or eight emails in act three. That probably wouldn't make sense. What, what you might do is you might have one or two emails that demonstrate your understanding of the problem and showcase empathy and how you understand the predicament that your listener is in. Then you might move on to act two and show, showcase some revisions in your understanding then you might move on to act three and have one or two emails showing the outcome, possibly interspersed by a few customer stories of how your customers have implemented your procedure and changed their lives. Then you cycle around the same sequence. So then you go back to demonstrating the problem. So again, you've got some options here. Yes, you know, if you were to have 30 emails, you could just split them sequentially so that you have seven emails or eight emails really digging into the problem and then seven or eight emails showing your revision in understanding and then seven or eight emails showcasing the outcome that you provide. But I think if you were to do that, you're probably laboring the point a bit. I think it would be, I think it would be more effective to cycle around the three acts and then have a call to action at the end of each act three email and then go back to demonstrating the problem again. But the point is, is that the 12 emails that I've recommended that you start with are just a starting point. It's a working assumption based on, based on what I've seen in my own email sequence. And it's a, it's a rule of thumb. And my, my length of thumb is going to be different to your length of thumb. So, you know, you should test including fewer and more emails in your, in your lead incubator sequence. The second variable then is story selection. In other words, what stories do you choose to share in your email sequence? Do you make them more personal? Do you open a vein and bleed a little more? 
and share more vulnerable stories from your past? Or do you share more directly business-related stories? Many of my clients tend to assume that the business-related stories are the ones that are going to resonate with their client base. And actually, that isn't my experience. My experience is it's the more personal stories where you share something that really went wrong or a time that was really quite dark for you. It's those stories that resonate on, on a deeper, on a much deeper emotional level. Because what we're doing by telling personal stories is we're building an emotional bond with the listener. The business related stories probably work better if you're emailing someone who is very close to buying and they're just kind of validating in their minds that yes, you can provide the outcome that you're saying that you can provide. But often the goal of the lead incubator is to establish a groundwork of trust. So for that reason, it's often the more personal stories, it's the more personal stories that work. But again, this is just a variable. So you might want to test having an A version of your sequence, which includes more personal stories, and a B version of your sequence that has more business-led stories. The next variable to discuss is story structure. In other words, for each email that you send, do you open up the email and launch straight into the drama of the story? That's what I call the open sandwich formula. And you can read about that in my simple story selling book. Or do you, launch, do you open each email with a line of content, normally a paragraph, just telling people what you're about to tell them and then have the story in the middle of the email. If you read my own lead incubator sequence or grab the book, you will see that I followed the closed sandwich format in my emails. And that's because for people who are new to your world, often you have to tell them what you're about to tell them. You know, they don't yet know you that well. So launching straight into a story isn't always the right approach. But again, this is a working assumption. This is something to test. So again, you know, you might create version A of your sequence where you launch straight into the middle of the drama and you really try to pull people into the story to keep them reading. And then you have version B of your lead incubator sequence where you tell them up front, you tell them at the start of each email what you're about to tell them, and then you go into the story. Other things that you can test, other variables, are the wording of your call to action or the wording of your offer and the nature of your offer. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of my clients are offering some time. It could be a time-based offer, but again, you might offer something else. It could be time, it could be, a, it could be something paid, it could be something free. Again, upfront, we don't know what's going to work, so you have to test different things. If you're offering 30 minutes on your calendar, you could vary the wording by calling it a free consultation, or you could, or you could give that time a name. Perhaps it's a discovery call or something else, but you know, you can vary the wording and see what wording works best. Another variable is to test the placement and the repetition of your call to action. In other words, do you just place the offer, the next step, at the end of the lead incubator sequence? Or do you drip it throughout the sequence? My starting point is probably to drip it throughout the sequence. But again, you could create another version where you save the call to action to the end and then go big at the end. That's what Gary Vaynerchuk would want you to do, is to go big on the call to action at the end. Another variable um, is proof elements. In particular, around the call to action. You know, you might test including different testimonials, different case studies. You might have an email, maybe at the very end of the sequence where you just share case studies, just share the results that you've delivered for your clients. So again, you could try including that in the sequence and then you could have a version where you don't include that just to see what the impact is. You know, we tend to assume that sharing more customer stories is going to help our results. And that may be the case. It may not be the case. So we have to test it. The third idea I want to talk about today is testing options. And testing options really splits between my, uh, macro and micro testing. So with macro testing, 
you're testing the big things. You're testing the number of emails in the sequence. You're testing the selection of stories overall. You're testing a completely different offer. So what you're doing then in your email marketing system is you're having a completely different automation flow. You're having sequence A in one place and then sequence B in another place. And these sequences are, well, they would probably start off like life where sequence B is a clone of sequence A, but then you make some adjustments to sequence B. You, you, you maybe add more emails to sequence B or you change the stories that are, that are included in sequence B. So you're running this kind of A, B test, and then you're pushing through a number of contacts. You know, it might be that you push through a, a few hundred contacts through version A and a few hundred through version B, and you measure, does sequence A or sequence B deliver more of your primary metric? Which, which version of your sequence delivers more discovery calls, if that's your primary metric? Before you declare one as a, as a winner, you just need to check, is, are the results statistically significant? And you're looking for a 95% confidence interval. You know, you can go to various websites on the internet to calculate those numbers, and you'll need to know how many people you've added to each sequence and what the conversion rate of each is. And then based on the, based on the number of people that you push through each version, it will tell you to what degree of st statistical s significance version A is the winner. Or it will tell you, actually, the results aren't meaningful yet, and maybe you need to run the test for a bit longer. Because what we don't want to do, what we never want to do is to is to declare version B as the winner, but do it early, but and do it on insufficient on an insufficient amount of data. You want to make sure that you're making decisions that are going to hold true over an extended period of time. Micro testing then is then testing within a sequence. So rather than creating an A version and a B version, with micro testing, you're optimizing within sequence A. And usually what this means is perhaps on a fortnightly basis, perhaps on a monthly basis, you're going back into your email platform and you're reviewing the open rates across every email in the sequence. And you're really looking for outliers. You're looking for emails that have especially high or especially low open rates, click-through rates, delivery rates. And then if you have an email that on the face of it seems like a perfectly good email, but maybe the open rate is low, then perhaps it needs a different subject line. So I wouldn't, you know, test subject lines as an A version and a B version of the sequence. I would do those, opt I would do those optimizations within the sequence. So you do those, opt you do those op optimizations in line. So you do those optimizations in line. In terms of the mechanics for testing, I think you've got a few options. So depending on your email marketing platform, some email platforms will let you split test version A and version B of a sequence. And they will you know, send 50% of new subscribers down, down one channel and 50% down another channel, and they will tell you which one is better. If your email marketing platform cannot do that, then you want to still create two versions of the sequence, which might look like, you know, depending on the platform, it might look like two campaigns, it might look like two automation flows. Annoyingly, every email, every email marketing platform uses different terminology for a sequence of emails, but you want to have two sequences. And then what I would look at doing is, if you can't A-B split test it within the email tool, you might be able to A-B split test your opt-in forms. So if, for example, you use something like Thrive Leads on your website to power your forms, you can create an A-B test of the forms where 50% of people see version A of the form, 50% of people see version B. And actually version A and version B look the same. Only version A of the form adds you, adds you to sequence A, version B of the form adds you to sequence B. Otherwise, the forms are the same. They look the same and they send you to, and they send you to the same thank you page, but they add you to a different sequence in the email marketing system. 
so that you can then measure, well, which of those sequences delivers you the most business. If you can't do that, if you can't A, B, split test your forms, on a really rudimentary level, you could look at placing different forms on different pages around your website. That would kind of be my last resort because it's the least scientific way of doing this. Ideally, you want to A, B test within the email marketing platform. If you can't do that, you might be able to A, B test on the opt-in forms that you're using. And as an absolute last resort, you know, you can have different opt-in forms for different sequences and place those forms on different pages. We're at the end of this episode. Hopefully you've got a few ideas for testing and optimizing your lead incubator sequence. Let's just do a bit of a recap. The lead incubator is a multivariate system for converting new leads into qualified prospects. And this system can be optimized. It's multivariate because there are multiple variables that can influence your results or your desired outcomes, but it's still a system that can be tested and optimized. And this is the way that we should be viewing this. This is the scientific based approach to marketing. And in some respects, what we're doing here is we're straddling both the artistic approach to marketing, because sharing your story and telling your story is an artistic expression of you. But then this is the more rational science-based approach of pushing some contacts through the system, measuring the outcome and testing, starting to test these different variables in order to optimize your results. You know, the, the artistic framework and the scientific framework always go hand, hand in hand. And what we've talked about today is very much on the scientific optimization side of things. The lead, the use case for the lead incubator is that it sets the groundwork for a trust or expertise based sale. That's really the use case for this. You provide high value services and people have to trust you before they'll sign up. If that doesn't describe you, then, you know, the, the use case for the lead incubator goes down. What this is doing and what we're doing here is we're eliminating the need for a big sales pitch by establishing trust up front when new contacts enter your world. I do think that today's episode is a very important episode because optimization is a hinge that can deliver big results. It can really transform your business outcomes. And actually compared to optimizing an ad account, optimizing an email marketing sequence it's essentially free. You know, there's, there's no additional cost of optimizing your, your lead incubator system. It's not like you have to spend any more on ads. All we're doing is we're taking the people that are opting into your world on an, on an ongoing basis, and we're splitting them into two different versions of the sequence. You know, in, in some respects, there's no real reason why you shouldn't do this. It's free to do. And the insights that you gain from this will help you increase your business profitability. I would encourage you to test slowly, test deliberately. When you are reviewing your test results, make sure that you're testing for statistical significance. And what we're looking for in an A-B test is 95% confidence, a 95% confidence interval that, you know, that version A if that looks like the winner, we want to be sure, we want to be at least 95% sure that version A is going to be the winner going forwards. Finally, keep a log of your learnings. Any test that you run, I think a big danger with doing this is that you test version A, you test version B, version B is the winner, so then version B becomes the control. It's very tempting just to move on. I think it's very important though to record your learnings, to create a testing document. This is especially important. The bigger your team gets, then you're going to want to communicate what you've tested in the past, what the learnings were. Otherwise you run the risk of making the same mistakes and having to relearn the same things over and over because you know you forget what you've done in the past. Or if you bring on a new team member or even a new contractor, they can't see those learnings because they weren't there. So keep a record of the tests that you've run. 
It could be as simple as having a Google Doc that you keep adding notes to of your hypothesis for the test, how many contacts you push through each version, and then what the business outcomes were of those two versions. You know, it doesn't have to be a complicated process. You just have to take, you just have to take a, a bit of time after the test to record what you've learned. And that's going to prop you up well going into the future. If you're ready to go off and create your own lead incubator sequence, you know, your new, create a new sequence to potential clients who are entering your world, then you can grab my own example sequence, uh, storyselling.biz forward slash incubator. Finally, if you'd like to work with me directly to create and optimize your own sequence, then the place to go to is storyselling.biz forward slash story hyphen jumpstart. If you go there, have a look at the information on that page, fill in the form, and we'll, and we'll go from there. On next week's episode of the Story Selling Podcast, I've got an interview with Conrad Sa- On next week's episode of the Story Selling Podcast, I've got an interview with Conrad Sanders to share with you, where we'll be talking about copywriting processes and documentation and how documentation can actually be really helpful and really sexy. So I hope you'll join me then. Otherwise, thank you as always for listening and I will talk to you next time.